Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. And Coach Tom. And this is Shot Science Overtime number 179. Wow. <laughs> every time. Yeah, every uh, time. Yeah. So uh, we want to welcome you guys to our live show. It's a show that we do so that we can talk to you guys face to face and kind of give some live answers to the people that are in need of some of that right. stuff. And uh, if this is not the kind of thing that you want to be hanging out with, that's cool. You don't have to comment. That's, <laughs> yeah. we know. Go and check out something else, like one of our other uh, videos that are tutorials or something like that. And uh, we will, uh, you know, this we'll do this for the people that want to check it out. Right. Um, but uh, we appreciate you being here. We're going to talk about a topic that we think is important to help you guys figure out the game of basketball a little bit. And while we're doing that, you guys are going to send us your comments or questions, and we'll get to those as soon as we finish what we're talking about. We just right. want to do something so we can get people to show up, give them a little time to uh, get here. Um, so if you are here, make sure you tell your friends and family to check us out. That helps Team Shot Science grow. And, uh, and yeah, so we're going to get into our topic in just a second. I want to remind you guys, go check out shotscience.com. We got all of our cool basketball stuff there. Uh, you can get the training gear that we have there, like the jump box. You can get the all access membership where we have our, uh, tutorial stuff, like our in-depth tutorials that go beyond what we do on YouTube. And you can sign up for that. Yeah t-shirts like the shot science shirts right. uh the naismith shirts um and uh you know just go check out shotscience.com a lot of cool stuff there um looks like people are showing up here yep uh we got damien saying hello we have santiago arlene uh lucky seven kid uh christian cruz uh kevin cole our buddy from ireland what's up kevin all right kevin and keegan's here too awesome so yep. glad you guys could be here. Uh, yeah, so make sure that you guys check out shotsnights.com and follow us, follow us on all of our you know social media stuff. Right. Okay, so our topic for today is uh, how to attack zone defense, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. people freak out about that a little bit because you don't have somebody that's necessarily guarding you f straight up. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that is really interesting about the game of basketball is that the way you attack generally, the way that you attack a man-to-man a -man defense is different than when you attack with a zone. And like Casey said, usually in your, you're in a man-to-man -man situation, uh, there's somebody on you all the time, even though the help side probably will slag off of their players away from the basketball, they're still responsible for those players defensively. Uh, when we're playing a zone, uh, then players are usually more uh, intent on protecting an area of the floor that is designated their area. Sometimes they'll move out of those areas, uh, but uh, they're responsible for an area. And the way you attack a zone is quite a bit different than in, when you attack a man-to-man. -man. And surprisingly, uh, a lot of offensive uh, teams have difficulty in attacking zones because the principles are kind of different. Yeah, so like like you were saying, man to man, somebody's going to pick you up. Right. Their their main responsibility is mostly you, yeah. and you know they're going to try to jump in passing lanes, try to sag off a little bit to help, but you are yeah. their kind of main concern. Yeah. In a zone, it is all about the territory and protecting that area. Yeah, and you guys probably already kind of know the basics of of this, but the upshot of it is is how do you attack a zone effectively? Okay, and Let's talk about some of those principles. One of the most, uh, uh, most important principles in attacking a zone is make sure that we have players in the gaps. In other words, if there is a 2-3 zone where there are two people out front, usually you have one out front and then there's one on either wing that allows us then to pass the ball effectively from one side to the other. Uh, if there is a one-out defense, like a 1-3-1, one, one, typically you would have offense having two guards out front, and they get that person between them, so they're in the gaps. And so gapping uh, the defense usually is a very effective way to uh, uh, attack the zone. Now, uh, let's talk about some zone principles, because I think these are really important. And they vary a little bit from what you find a man to man. Number one, one of the things you want to do is make the defense adjust. Make them constantly be in a situation where they are adjusting for where the ball is and for where players, offensive players are. It's just like we always talk about 
you want to put the other team or other player in recovery mode yeah. so that you're a step ahead. And right. when it's man to man, you're trying to get that person to play catch up with you. Right. When it's zone, you're trying to get them out of position. And again, you can get them out of you know off off of you trying to play catch up as well. Right. But out of position is like a big one. Right. And you get that through ball movement and attacking the gaps and yeah. and flashing and things like that. All right. So let's go to the first principle. Probably the first principle is ball movement, as we mentioned a while ago. And what we want to do is make the ball move from one baseline out and around the defense and to the opposite baseline. That's what we call just uh, uh, swinging the ball, okay? And when we do that, what we, we get a complete uh, series of slides, probably my, maybe five slides, Slides are the movements of those defensive players in their zone area. So we get about five slides as we swing the ball around the floor. And when we reverse it back to the other side, we get five more slides. And if you have offensive players who are moving inside the zone, uh, either flashing or just uh, uh, stepping up into the middle or whatnot, then that creates situations where somebody usually gets behind the slide pattern and leaves somebody open. So re ball reversal from one side to the other is really important. Yeah, it's, it's all about patience and opportunity. Yeah, and some of the best zone attackers, uh, teams that attack those well, get those ball reversals. And they get the ball also from one side of the floor to the other by skipping the ball. Uh, skip passing is something that we take the ball over our head and we're going to take and go over the top of the defense or skip all those players and give it to a player on the opposite side of the floor. Now, when that happens, those players on that side of the floor have to close out aggressively. And when you're closing out to uh, uh, an offensive player on defense, if you're too reckless with it, they will attack you right away and they're able to go by you because you're going north and he's going south or something in that particular scheme. Okay, and so ball movement creates and then skip the ball the, to the backside. So those, that's a technique. The other thing is this, when we have players who are in uh, those seams, as the ball swings from side to side and you find that a seam opens up, in other words, the players aren't very uh, diligent in pinching those clothes, attack that seam. So attacking a seam and getting into the middle of the defense on his own, that's really important. Yeah, and a lot of times when you are on the perimeter, you'll see that there's going to be defenders that are basically straddling you because yeah. they're not necessarily playing uh, you know, a man-up type of zone where they're trying to kind of play one-to-one -one person. So they might be straddling you, yeah. and you'll see. You know, there'll be a gap like this. There's a right. defender here and a defender over here. And you attack that seam right between them because that yeah. forces them to have to come together. And when that happens, either they're going to get there or and stop you, or that's going to pull them in, and that's going to create opportunities for your teammates that are sure. out and around because you've just sucked two guys in together, and now that opens up the floor. Right. And so you can dish it off to a teammate. And if they don't come together or don't, you know, meet in the middle, then you basically can just keep that attack going and go to the basket. Right. One of the things that we want to talk about on ball reversal that's really important is we want to swing the ball pretty quickly uh, from one side to the other so they have to make quick adjustments. Once uh, you have the ball at a position, usually one player will step out and, and play that guy in that particular area, but he's still in his zone. Uh, they won't just lay back and let you do whatever you want. Uh, if I were facing a 2-3 zone and I threw the ball to the right, as soon as I throw the ball out to the right wing, that guard on top is going to go out and play them, and so that usually leaves me open, okay? And so they can reverse the ball to me. I can reverse it to the other side, okay? Yeah, and if, and if you are uh, doing the ball reversal, you don't want to throw it and then just wait for them to recover, right. then throw it again, wait for them to recover. Right. You really want to try to get them out of position. Yes. And, you know, those skip passes are going to make a big difference because, yes. uh, you know, you're going to get them trying to recover from one side of the floor all the way to the other side. Right. And that's really hard. And uh, you just have to be careful with the skip pass because it's, it's a little bit of a dangerous fly, no-fly zone. Yeah, well, one of the things that helps you is this, is that when we're swinging the ball from side to side, oftentimes defensive players will step out into the passing lane. 
And when you find defensive players that are doing that, you use a technique that we call fake a pass to make a pass. And if I, uh, if I find that I'm playing out in front and that guard jumps into that pass to the wing or it looks like he's going to do that, I'll make a pass fake to the middle. And so he can't, he can't allow that ball to get into the middle of the floor, and so he usually will stop and he'll recover. So I make that fake pass, and then I throw it to the person that I want to throw it to. So we're really huge when you're playing against uh, zone defenses, the idea of fake a pass to make a pass. And, and c- kind of coming off that a little bit too, one of the other things that we'll say about attacking a zone is that the p- people in the post play a big yeah. play a, a big role in this as well. Right. If you're in the post, you shouldn't just be standing there and stand with your guy or behind one of the guys. You should be flashing in those open areas and those gaps, right. and you should be cutting in, looking for the ball, and your teammates around the perimeter, they should be looking to get you the ball there too. Because And just because they get the ball into you doesn't mean that you suddenly have to make a move to the basket or whatever. You can catch the ball. That can suck in the defense too, and then you can pop the ball back out after they relocate. And that's the other thing I was going to say is that if you are on the perimeter and you pass the ball on the post, don't just stand there. Relocate. Relocate. Because as soon as you do that, you're going to move away, and that post player will get you the ball back, and the people that were guarding you or had you kind of in their area, they're not going to have you tracked. They don't know where you are. Yeah, and that's one you'll see a ton. You'll see it in, in the tournament games that you're watching today. You'll see it in the NBA a little bit, is that when that player dumps it into the post, and they relocate, it's it's like creating a wide open shot yeah, for yourself. You really lose that person. What's real important is when we have somebody playing at the high post, one of the things that we want them to not do is to track the basketball. Tracking is this, is that if the ball is at the point and the ball is thrown to the left wing, the guy in the middle goes to that side of the floor at a high post. Then it's returned to the point guard, and here's the, the post player right in the middle again at the top of the key or at the free throw line or just under it. And then the ball goes to the other. And so he's just tracking where the ball goes. What you don't think about is this, is that when you're tracking, the defense can keep track of you a lot easier because they know what you're doing. Even though you might be behind the two people in front, they can keep track of you. One of the things that that we really like to do is this, is let the ball get ahead of you. In other words, if the ball is over on the left wing and it's thrown to the point, just hold right there at that elbow and let the ball get ahead of you. And then they swing it to the opposite wing. Now flash into the middle and show them your hands. You'd be surprised how many times you can catch the ball in the middle and turn and shoot it if you don't track the basketball. Uh, That definition again is every time the ball moves from one spot to another, you move in the middle, out to the wing, and just back and forth. And... You cannot catch the basketball very effectively when they're doing that. So if you let the ball get ahead of you, then you'll find that when you flash to the basketball at the wing, or even at the point for that matter, it's easier to get you the basketball. One of the key points against a zone defense is get the ball in the middle. Yep. Once the ball is in the middle of that defense in the paint, now the whole game kind of changes because we've got somebody there who is an immediate threat to the basket. Our players is this. You in the middle the first thing you do is turn to look to shoot it now and uh, i find uh, and we don't necessarily play with a big who is slow and and can't move very well right there we actually go with somebody uh even a guard sometimes who can catch the ball turn face up and drop that shot on him right away or you have a little bounce pass to the 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 guy that is at the block but the idea is once you get the ball inside don't just get it in there and then kick it out you're inside the lane. Let's get that shot off if we can. Either you take it or you give it to somebody else. As soon as you get the ball in the middle, the guy who is playing the middle of that defense is probably going to step up to you. And when they step up to you, they leave that person in the hole wide open. So that's an important element as well is how we get the ball into the middle and what we do with it when we catch it. Okay. So <laughs> I, let's wrap this up a little bit. But okay. the, the general theme of zone defense or attacking the zone defense is that you want to attack the gaps. You want to move the ball, whether that's the, a ball reversal around, the, around mm-hmm. the horn, basically, or doing a, a skip pass where you're going from one side of the court okay. to the other. Look middle. Look for the middle. And if you're playing the post, mm-hmm. make sure you're hitting the gaps, too, and flashing. If you pass down into the post, make sure that you are relocating so that you can get an open shot on the, the kick out. And uh, one, one thing I will say, too, is that 
when you're playing zone or when you're playing against a zone, you have to think about the ball as having a certain amount of gravity in terms of attracting the defense. Yep. You pop it into the middle, it's going to pull the, the defenders into that. And if you pop it on, if you attack a gap, it's going to pull them into that. So the ball has gravity when it comes to <laughs> zone defense. And that's what you want to do. You want to get those situations where you're pulling those players in together because that's going to occupy one, two, or three of them, or, you know, two or three of them at one time. And that leaves openings for your other teammates. Right. right? Okay. There, there's probably another five or six things that we would cover, but we're going to take and clip it right there and move on to your questions. Yeah. So uh, let's get into the question and answer stuff. Thank you guys for sending your questions. Yeah. Please keep sending them in. All right. uh, before we get into answering your questions, we have a question for you guys. And that question is our question of the week. Every time we have one of these shows, we want to know this one question. What is it? Drum roll, please. <laughs> where are you located in the world? Yeah. We'd like to know where you are and listening to this program or watching it. Okay. Yeah, we want to know because we're in Santa Cruz, California, which is near San Francisco on the coast of California. Yep. And we want to know where you guys are. Are you from Zimbabwe? Are you from Saudi Arabia? Are you from... Lithuania. Lithuania. Right. We have to say Lithuania every single time. <laughs> uh, South Africa. We want to know. And uh, we will shout out as many people as we can. Like Zeno here who says, yo, greetings from Amsterdam. All right. All right. What's going on? Um, cool. So keep sending those in and we'll jump into answering some of these questions from you guys. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um... This is from Damien, who says, "How do I improve? Uh, how do I improve my quickness from an average level to the best as a high schooler? To my best as a high schooler. P.S. I'm terrible. Improve your quick. Are you talking about your quickness? I would say uh, you need to work on kind of these repetitive, explosive." footwork drills and things like that well, whether that's tell them where they can find them you can check out shotscience.com and we have a training section in the all access area uh you can also check out the vertical jump videos on our youtube channel um there there's a ton of things you can do uh you know explosive sprints whether right. that's ladder drill or uh you know sometimes called suicides or regular sprints dot drills uh using the the footwork ladder uh, there's a ton of things to do, but check out that, those things that I just mentioned. You know, even though Casey was talking about the vertical jump, uh, we we know that the uh, um, the exercise and whatnot that we have in the vertical jump really help you with explosiveness, and that that's really key to quickness. Okay, uh, let's see here. A lot of people are talking about zones in here, so I did not. <laughs> let's see. Uh, Anch Wad. Wow, says, how to increase my shooting range? Uh, you know, one of the things that is important there is that you start closer in and you develop the shooting mechanics that are going to work for you at that, sp that particular distance. And then you move back gradually. What you find is that if you really focus on your folk mechan uh, your uh, uh, shot mechanics as you move backward, now that doesn't mean that's all maybe in one day, but let's say that over a course of a week, you move from eight feet to 10 feet to uh, 14 feet out to uh, the three-point line, you'll find that you begin to develop the feel uh, for that particular distance. And so uh, what happens if you you get pretty good at the mid-range and all of a sudden you go out to the three-point line, you start putting them up, you're, you're just heaving the ball usually, and so it won't be very effective. But if you just work on the, the elements of the stroke and gradually move out over a period of days uh, or even weeks, you'll find that it really improves for you a whole bunch. It's all about a progression. Yeah, you can't you can't rush it. You can't take the the three footer and then jump out to twenty feet and expect yeah. it to work. Yeah. You got to take the time to master it from close in and work back using something like the form shooting drill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay, we got Sup Fake from Honolulu, Hawaii. We have uh, George, who's from Russia. All right, George. Nicholas is from Pennsylvania. Stian says hello from Norway. All awesome. Right. All right, cool. Um, Paul or Paul Soul says great channel. Daughter changed shot this year. Hit game winner for championship. Thank All right. you. All right. Awesome, Paul. Yeah. Uh, tell her uh, we're very impressed. <laughs> um, who else is on here? Uh, George from Russia. Did I say George already? Yeah, um, okay, let's get back to some questions. So keep sending us in where you guys are from. We want to hear that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, Kevin, our buddy from Ireland, says, the last two games I played, I didn't score a basket against a zone D. 
about zero for 10 for both. How can I get out of this slump? Well, oh, where, where were you shooting from? Um, you know, that really helps to know. Is that Was it from a position that was in your range? Is it something that you would practice on that particular range? Were you rushing shots? You were rushing. Were they contested? Yeah, those are all important elements. And one of the things you want to think about is sometimes they're going to be quick and they'll get to you in a hurry. And so maybe there's no shot there. And remember that. Sometimes when we get uh, the ball moving against zones, we think we've got a shot and we heave it up there. And that's the key word, heave. What we want to do is uh, don't be afraid to dis determine that there's not a shot there for you yet. OK, and oftentimes what will happen is that players are rushing at you. And this is this could be just this, the same in man to man uh, offense as well. They're rushing at you really hard. You attack them immediately and you find yourself in a, a better shooting situation because you get by them. OK, and so that's some ideas to hopefully will help you a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the other thing, too, is that people worry so much about slumps. Yep. And they get so uh, kind of dejected about it, and they, yeah. it's, it kind of poisons their mind. And the thing is, is that everybody is going to go through little streaks where they miss a bunch of shots in a row. It doesn't matter if you're Steph Curry, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, whoever. Uh, yeah. You will have a period where you miss 10 in a row. Yeah, yeah. Big deal, because when you look at the, the kind of long range of, of or spectrum of your shooting over time, then you're going to see there's going to be little ups and downs all the time. Yep. Oh, and when you average those out over that longer period, you'll see that, oh, that wasn't such a big deal. Yeah. However, it becomes a problem, <clears throat> excuse me, when you focus on that stuff and you're like, oh, man, I'm 0 for 10 and I'm just terrible. I'm the worst player. I'm in such a slump. I can't do anything. But then you will start to see that you will stay in that slumpy type of uh, area. Yeah. And, and the thing that you want to think about, too, is that then oftentimes you think, well, I can't shoot that anymore. And so you, <laughs> you just stop shooting yeah. or shooting certain shots. That shouldn't be the concern for you. The concern for you is what Casey's talking about there. Uh, let's stay with it. In fact, you you know, great shooters like uh, Curry and Thompson and <coughs> and Dirk Nowitzki and people like that, they probably never think. Uh, in fact, you you'll he'll hear Curry talk about this. He doesn't spend any time worrying about the fact he's missing because he has confidence in himself, confidence in his stroke, yep. and he keeps shooting. And, and there and, was a game just uh, uh, this last week, I think, where he went one for nine, uh, and then all of a sudden, bang, 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 he, he hit about five or six in a row. And so what you want to do is just really work on those mechanics and not be afraid uh, to shoot it just because you're, you're not hitting every one of them. Uh, and like I said, uh, knowing what is a good shot is really important for you. And there's a mental aspect to it and then the kind of more physical, mechanical yeah. aspect. The mental aspect is don't get down on yourself, have confidence, work yep. on it, yep. and, and keep shooting. Yep. The, the mechanical part of it is if you have a problem, you need to fix it, whether yep. that's rushing shots, forcing it. Bad uh, taking, mechanics. Taking bad, or yeah, bad mechanics and addressing mm -hmm. that. But uh, you have to have both of those kind of working for you. But you have to do the work when nobody is watching to pay off when everybody is. Exactly. So you have to do that uh, behind the scenes. Okay. Um, Al Vince is asking how to attack the basket even when there's someone tall in front of you? Well, uh, you know, that's a difficult question because sometimes what happens is that we, if we attack the basket and we get there and there's a big waiting for us to block the shot, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, about nine different uh, ways to attack that defender, which would help you score. If you go to our YouTube channel, you'll find that, and I think it's nine finishes at the rim. Isn't that it's right? It's called finishes at the rim. Yeah, and that could help you out. The other thing is, if somebody comes in front of you like that, we always want our players to jump stop. In other words, we're not going to run into them and take, give them a charging foul. What we're going to do is we're going to jump stop, and then as soon as we do that, what happens is momentarily the game stops because nobody knows what you're going to do. You may not even know. And we have uh, this particular rule. If you get in there and jump stop and it's getting hairy, reverse turn to the outside and look for somebody to give the ball to. Will there be people open on the perimeter? Uh, there will be because as you attack the basket, what happens is most defenses will tend to collapse to protect the heart of the defense. And that leaves defenders or off your teammates open for possible shots from that particular area. But if it, there there isn't any uh, uh, really... Uh, I think one of the things is that, you know, people get so caught up in 
uh, you know, mm-hmm. so and so is taller than me, yep. they're stronger than me, blah, blah, blah. Those are things you have no control over. Sure. And so why focus on that as, uh, you know, something that is kind of a competitive disadvantage for you? Sure. Why don't you focus on the conven- uh, competitive advantages that you have? Like you're probably quicker than, than that person. You can psychologically use the fact that they probably think they're going to block you or take advantage of you against them. So, you know, you might give them a shot fake and they're going to jump for it because they, they want to block your shot and they think that they can. So get them up in the air and then you've got them right where you want them. Uh, but if you're just cowering and you're worried because, oh, that guy is so tall, how am I possibly going to get this shot off? Don't num- shoot num- the ball. Num- yeah, number yeah. one, you've already psyched yourself out. Number two, you should have a whole toolbox of, of things that you can yeah. do to make that guy sorry that he stepped in front of you. Well, here's a, here's one of the keys to this as well. And you know, it happens to be a part of uh, we run the dribble drive offense, and, and this we see this often. In fact, we take advantage of it as much as possible. When that big rotates to a, a somebody who is attacking the basket and we make the jump stop, we know right away his defender or his player is wide open. And we usually can bounce the ball through him for an easy basket. Oftentimes what happens is that we get help side defense will slide in there. But remember this is that when you jump stop, now everything stops and you can make choices. I can see that he's left his man open. I give him the ball. I reverse turn. I kick it out. Okay, and that's, that's some of the best basketball that you'll ever see anywhere is drive and kick, drive and kick, and not drive and force a shot up and, and, a, and a hope shot at that. A hope shot is one that you hope will go in, probably won't, okay? Okay, Nicholas A. says, you guys are so helpful with many of your drills, and they have definitely made me better. Thank you so much for the time you put in to make us better. Awesome. How cool. How that's cool. that's the reason that, that we so do it, much, man. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, okay, Jared Sampson is asking, how can I improve driving when my lane is blocked? There's, if, if the lane is blocked, you cannot just take and force your way through it, okay? And so um, one of the things that's really important is to develop some, some maneuvers. Uh, we just have, offensive attacks. Uh, yeah, and, and here's a possibility of what I'm talking about. Every time you catch the basketball, the only time you want to drive is if you've got, you think you have a lane to the basket, okay? And so if that guy is right there in your grill, you could shot fake him. And then um, one of the best moves, kind of coined this, but it has to do with as well. And you sell well, it a bunch with your eyes too. You do, yeah. The eyes go to the rim, and then we give them that little quick pump, and our legs never straighten out when we do that. People who want to block shots, as soon as you bring that up, their legs straighten out, and they're looking to maybe get in the air to block it. And then it's time to just go on them. And they probably are going to foul you as you do it. Yep. Okay? That's um, just a, a, a little – we've got other things in our videos that probably would help you yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, Jared, you just – you don't want to force it. You want to have some moves when you get to the basket, whether that's the finishes at the rim or the attacks or whatever. But also, if you get to drive in there and the defense collapsing you, somebody's open. Yeah. So hit them. Uh, okay, Canal says – how can I improve decision making on the court? Oh gosh, you know, that that's experience a t- number one. That's a tough one, and Casey's right on. You develop that by having opportunities to try different things. Okay, and uh, as you do that, you begin to okay, that works pretty good in this situation. That one over there, and that, that that that. So you cancel that one out, and so just through that uh, experimentation and developing some. Uh, confidence and what does work for you will help you to deal with that whole thing it's yeah. it's all about confidence eric granith is from sweden cool and, and sweden and sweden and sweden yeah, he hit us a couple <laughs> times uh mbg11 is bertran from istanbul turkey all oh, right um who says if you don't have any three-point threat what would you recommend against a two-three zone we would recommend that you get that shooting three-point threat down. Yeah, you need to have, when you're facing zones, it's really good to have a couple of guys who can can shoot it and shoot it pretty effectively from there. Attack the gaps. I mean, uh, that's the big one. Reverse uh, the, all those things that we talked about. Yeah, and you know what's going to happen, too? If, if the other team knows that you have no shooters, the defense will be tighter, and they will not extend further out to contest shots. 
take a few of them, but they, the defense squeezes down on the, on the painted area. And so what you need to do is get them to extend out and then attack the seams. Uh, and you, it, maybe you can't shoot threes, but maybe we could shot, uh, give them a shot fake and step into a seam and maybe we get a little mid-range jumper in there. Uh, but it, it is really important to be able to shoot the ball from the outside. Um, maybe one or two people got to be able to do that. Okay. Okay, our buddy Giddy Witties from Maryland. Awesome. All right, all right. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, Danny Rueda saying, where do I have my shot line, right hand, and where do I position my chest? I will say that we have answered this question multiple times, yeah. but I would tell you to go to shotscience.com and get the all-access membership where we break down shooting completely. Yeah. We show you all of that stuff. I mean, we could pick up the ball. We can show you right here, this is how you hold it and blah, blah, blah. But I think that it does you better if you go check that out because we have graphics, we have slow motion demonstrations, and we really just break it down. Well, and you can look at it over and over and over and over again and, and get the feel for, oh, okay, I missed that the first time through. It's just hard to cram it. But but go that check that really out. help you a bunch. Yeah. Um, okay, so Kevin Samara is asking, how do you get ready for a game during school? Um, you know... <clears throat> That's, that's an interesting question. Preparation um, for games it is different for everybody. Yeah, it really is. And some people start thinking about it probably early in the day uh, that they're going to have a game. And other people uh, kind of defer it until they're, they're not in the classroom anymore and they're getting into that focus in the gym uh, and the locker room, et cetera. And that's when they begin to, to, to uh, focus pretty hard on the game. One of the things I find that is, is really kind of uh, uh, distressing as a coach is this, is that you have players who don't really think about it at all. Uh, they come down and get dressed and you go through your pregame uh, uh, talk and they still aren't thinking about it all mu that much. And they go out and warm up and I watch them warm up and I know right away we're in trouble because they have a, they're not ready to play. And one of the things that's so important is having that mental preparation that you're talking about. And I think that even if you start, uh, let's say if you have a game at, uh, let's say, 7 o'clock or something and you get out of school at 3, you've got some time there to kind of focus on what things you think you need to do for uh, preparation for the game. And a lack of preparation probably is uh, going to, end up being uh, and the more guys that are in that same spot is you're probably going to get beat yeah okay. i mean it really comes down to just kind of doing some mental rehearsal yep. being positive uh and not freaking out about things that you have no control over um and then when you get into doing the warm-up stuff you're kind of locking in and it's not not about mm -hmm. <clears throat> screwing around or any of that stuff you know that's the probably one of the key points too is uh, what do you do in your warm-ups i've seen teams go out and i i'm just blown away they're just they're playing games horsing around focus on the game is it's obviously not there and our teams do that too from time to time uh, i don't know how many times i've got on the floor during uh, uh, warm-ups call them all together and said okay this is what's going on and this is the result of what's going to happen if we don't change this right now and sometimes you can kind of affect a change and they start to get more focus, start thinking about the game a little bit more, sometimes not. And when I, when I see that, uh, I just know it's going to be a hard time for us. Okay, fly, <coughs> excuse me, Flying Cow says, how do I shoot threes without jumping forward? Okay. Okay. Part of it is, is that it's okay to jump a small amount and, a and end, inches, up, yeah. Yeah, and end mm -hmm. up a little bit forward. You don't want to jump and end up you know, a foot, two feet, whatever forward, because what happens is that you are creating a complexity, your shot, you're adding more variables, you become a, uh, you know, the target is, is stationary, you're moving, you don't want that to happen, because any kind of directionality to what you're doing is going to change your delivery of the ball, yeah. if you're fading away, your shot just became twice as hard, yeah. if you're f f falling forward, same thing, falling to either side, same issue. You're creating these complexities or variables that make your shot more complex, which make it less repeatable, less consistent, and less accurate. So what you want to do is, is really work on eliminating any of that kind of right. jump forward. It's because they don't have the power. Way back. Progress back. You'll find that you build up all of that muscle memory, that innervation, that connection, and you will start to not have to do. Um, and, you know, uh, Zeno's here saying it's like he 
did things is are the best approach to get you to your highest potential faster. Yeah. You can reach a potential doing something goofy, but that doesn't make it the best approach. The reason why you don't want to jump forward is because is this backboard. Okay. Important is that and if you talk to most people, or in fact, any people that are really good about uh, shooting mechanics, they will tell you that probably you want to take off uh, uh, in one spot and land essentially on that spot. Like sharp shoot, hit a target, you a stationary target. You're trying to make yourself as stationary as possible. So when we're talking about forward horizontal momentum into vertical momentum, because we don't want the horizontal momentum being carried over into the delivering the, of the ball to the target. As soon as you do that, you add a variable. Your shooting percentage goes way down. Well, and you can see in a shooter like Dirk Nowitzki. Uh, he actually oftentimes falls back and, and as his landing area is a little bit behind where his takeoff area rather than rushing the basket. So it varies, but the thing that you got to remember is try not to lunge at the basket. Yeah, eliminate all non-essential yeah. variables. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> Russell Westbrook is asking, how can I boost my shooting percentage? Practice, 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 and... Take better shots. And taking better <laughs> shots. Diligent approach, purposeful approach to your practice. Yeah. Three pillars of practice. Uh, what else can we tell you? I mean, that's really what it is. There is no, you know, magic pill. Um, let's see here. Okay, now go back up there to the flying cow. He's right there. Yeah, there's several of them. Well, this one right here. Okay. Um, we just did this one. How do we shoot? Oh, okay, I didn't think we had done that yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, Giddy Witty says, favorite scoring move, most efficient scoring move. Gosh, everybody has one that they like. And, and if that's the important thing. Is this something that you really have confidence in doing uh, in scoring? Uh, and it might be a shot. It might be an attack on the basket. Um, you know, it's, I, I, I think that, you know, everybody's going to be different. Yeah, yeah, it um, is. F f you can answer too. But for okay. me, it would be just... Number one, moving without the basketball, knowing how to do that, and you will find yourself getting so many open shots, yeah. it's ridiculous. Number two would be attacking the basket because you're either going to get a shot, get a foul, or get a foul and a shot, yep. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so people want to hear you know, you know, crossover combo uh, into a you know double clutch. That's what works for you. Yeah. Yep. Simple. Get it done. Um, and if you can get a basket and a foul against the other team, you just did something that is yeah. more impressive than, than most any of those moves yeah. are. Yeah, right. Um, okay. <coughs> uh, Malek Zimre Zimreli says, is from Tunisia. Right. Which NBA play, player shooting would form would you recommend? We don't recommend <laughs> any specific player. I right. think that's a mistake. Yes. Uh, you know, when you try to emulate somebody else, it's impossible because their ergonomics are going to be different than you. And their, you know, uh, th what they did was they put their fundamentals together and they arrived at where their their shooting is. And that's what you should do too. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And in fact, one of the things that that we encourage is that you take a look at the basic elements of shooting. Um, the mechanics of shooting, and then try to work yourself into those. Now, you can see those on our <laughs> channel, uh, um, and that will really help you establish your own. Now, you know, we have students who um, we teach them exactly what we think is the best way to do, and what happens is usually there will be some little thing that they do, like uh, we like to have you shooting above the shooting eye. Some of them will take and slide out to the shoulder a little bit. We don't encourage that, but because we think that uh, causes them to maybe not shoot as effectively. But they, they kind of develop their own uh, uh, program out of that. And so shooting just like uh, uh, Curry may not work for you. Shooting just like Nowitzki may not shooting for you. I mean, it may just not work for you. And so you have to find something that is going to be, that's going to fit you and, and your, like Casey was saying, your ergonomics. Yeah, I mean, I'll just belabor it a little bit, but consider the fact that maybe you're five foot eight and you're trying to shoot like somebody that's six foot 10 yeah. with freakish proportions where their arms are, you know, a wingspan yeah. of seven foot four. Yeah. 
that does not translate to your body. And so you shouldn't try to force that into your kind of body mechanics. Right. You, you know, your, your physiology doesn't necessarily match up with that person. Right. So, so take the fun and those pieces will make you arrive at a better important yeah. part of it. Yeah. Um, do you start teaching, attacking, and defending zone? Okay. So do you coach your, uh, a school team or your own club? You've done both. Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I still coach uh, high school basketball, and um, I was involved in uh, club learning how to shoot the basketball. And so um, that's usually a, a, about the right time to, to touch them, but some people don't have the folks that you can do that at that age. Yeah, that's it, a good time to uh, maybe do that. Yeah, it's tough if, if you if you know, I mean, people start at different times. Is yeah. I think that you should always do man to man first. And that's what they should be doing at the lower levels of youth basketball. Right. Because zone, uh, it, it's great when you're in a very competitive setting. It's kind of lazy when you're dealing with young kids. Well, and it can become a problem with, uh, you know, really teaching them the game. Yeah, one of the things that, that I've had in my mind about this for a long time is, is this, is that uh, zone defenses for young people is, is, uh, allows laziness where you don't really move your feet. Uh, there's very little intensity. It's just, just kind of regarding this area. And one of the things that, that I think is important is that you need to be able to learn how to stop one-on-one -on -one or attack one-on-one, -on -one, yep. which you don't always get a chance to do in zone defenses. And I know an awful lot of club teams and probably uh, youth teams and things like that uh, go with zone defense because it takes very little teaching involved to kind of set up a, a kind of a defense. And uh, usually at the lower levels, those zone defenses work a little better, even though they're not, probably not as well taught, but they work uh, uh, because it's, it's hard for younger players to shoot from the perimeter and be effective. It's hard for them to have the dribble skills where they can attack a seam and, and uh, really do well with that as well. And so following up what Casey said, we've, we always have our youth teams, they always learn to play man-to-man -man defense. Yep. Other coaches hated us for that. Um, yeah, and Zeno is saying most efficient scoring move is an open layup. Yeah, I mean, yep. easy buckets are easy points, so yep, they are. go right. for it. Um, Dr. Al says, what would you recommend me practicing with a fractured dominant wrist? Practice your other, other yeah, arm. You, if you work on that other hand, you'll be surprised in the matter of six weeks while the other one is, is repairing itself, how much better you get with that other hand. Uh, and, and that is going to be with you for your lifetime because that doesn't go away. You might get a little cr uh, rusty uh, rusty with it, but you'll be surprised how quick it comes back. And, you know, this brings up another uh, comment that I think is, is really worth mentioning here. One of the things that we do as players and coaches sometimes allow us to do this is we don't spend any time really on our ball skills. And the reason that we don't spend time on our ball skills is this. There's no friggin' reward. There just is no reward for us there that we can visualize. In reality, when you're shooting, hey, the reward is that ball goes through the hoop, and that gives you that great feeling, uh, I made one, okay? And so uh, you'll tend to want to do that again and again and again, and you tend to do it uh, more the more often you put it in there that you want to put it in more often than that. And in ball skills, there's not that reward right away. But And so we are always telling kids, that you need to take and get by that and work on your ball skills because if you'd be surprised at guys like Curry and Kyrie Irving and so many of those other great guards in the NBA, they can break you down uh, with the right hand or the left hand. They're, they're equally as good with those because they spend time on it. Yeah, I mean, like we've said many times before, there's there's – different types of players there's yeah. the players that get down on themselves and sulk and oh i broke my arm or my leg or uh, i twisted my ankle or whatever and i'm gonna just i'm gonna become the worst player ever and blah, blah. and it just becomes like this woeful self you know yeah. uh, loathing moment yeah but then there's the players that actually end up being the great players that take those as opportunities yeah man it's a bummer exactly. that i broke my arm but you know what i'm going to do i'm going to spend all of that time working on my other arm yep. or working on my foot speed or working on my conditioning or whatever it is yep. and suddenly you'll find out oh what well now i can dribble with my with my off hand and i'm i'm even better with that hand than I was with the other hand. Yeah. And uh, now I can make a layup with that with that offhand, or I'm now faster, I'm more in sh whatever. Uh, 
take it as an opportunity. Yep. The people that are just whiners, uh, you know, <laughs> they never become great players. Yeah. Yeah. True. <laughs> um, okay. Ruben is saying, can I get a shout out? What's up, Ruben? I hey, guess Ruben. you have an Instagram. People can check that out if they want. All right. Uh, All right cool. Minnow is saying, uh, as a center that's not extremely tall, how are you dominant on the ball? Like the ball doesn't get snatched away easily. Sorry, my English for my English. I'm from the Netherlands. Okay. That's pretty good English, man. Yeah, it is. Well, let me just give you these a couple of tips. One of the things that we teach everybody who is in the post area is that when the ball comes into them, don't allow your hands to be close to your chest because it's easy enough for a defender to reach over uh, from behind you and knock the ball oh, away. Okay. And so what we want to do is always have the arms extended away from our body so we can catch the ball, push it out a little further. So we catch it here. And then as soon as we get it, we're right up under our chin. Uh, and we call this a position of power. And, and it's really hard for them to knock the ball loose there. But if the ball is coming to me and my arms are in here close, they can tap that away before I even touch it. Okay. Well, here, and, here's a demonstration. If, uh, if I hold the ball like this here, Dad, give it a, give it a pop. So I w didn't have very much power and I had my elbows down, my arms were at the side. If I do this, position of power, ball is chin, my elbows are out, I'm squeezing the ball, give it a whack. And now the thing that comes out of that too is that when the elbows are out, that keeps defenders from sliding around in front of you either to deter the uh, uh, pass to you. So hopefully people, that'll people work. Don't, people don't like going out around those, no. those, those sharp elbows. elbows. Yeah. Um, so give that one a shot. All right. Um, I guess this is Ms. Alvarez or Ms. Alvarez. I have this bad habit of dragging my foot when I shoot. This habit gets me off balance, and I would like to know how to fix it if it's oh. off the dribble. Okay. Tell them where to find it. Go to shotscience.com yeah. and check out our all-access membership area. We talk about uh, shooting off the dribble or off the pass, right. <clears throat> and uh, you know a lot of it comes down to getting those mechanics right, slowing it down, and getting the uh, just working it up to game speed. Yeah, um, and we go through that in in those sections. You know, one of the things that we don't often think about in sports, uh, in most sports, is this is that most every sport, especially those that are requiring the use of a ball of some kind, have to do with how we use our feet. Yep, footwork. Uh, and <clears throat> one of the things that happens is that sometimes we're really sloppy with our feet and that keeps us from being more successful. One of the things that we talk about when we're talking about uh, delivering the basketball for a pass, uh, shooting the basketball, dribbling the basketball, it always has to do with how we're using our feet yep. to get us to where we want to be, to protect the basketball. All of those things are really important. And so as you're looking, and this is a footwork problem for you, and we can help you if you go to those video locale that Casey was just citing there, and we'll, it shows you there how to use your feet, and there's no time when you should be dragging one. You want to have the balance, the uh, one two weight, footwork right into it. Right, and and you've got the balance on both feet. You're yep. not shooting off one. If you're dragging one, you're probably shooting off one leg. And so what we want to do is take and get both those feet in there. And we, we kind of talk about the feet as being this: uh, stop foot, gather foot. And the stop foot is the first one you lay down, and that's going to stop most of your momentum. The other foot gathering is coming around and getting you so you are stable so that you can shoot more accurately. Okay. Uh, Zeno's saying, whiners don't win and winners don't whine. We agree. Uh, that, that's I, kind I of like what we were comment. just saying. Yeah, you betcha. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's get this one here. <laughs> Uh, let's see. This was from our buddy Kevin, who's here all the time. He says, hi, guys. The last two games, I couldn't score one from about 10 attempts. How can I increase in-game confidence, even though today I made 80 of 111 mid-range shots? Okay, we already kind of talked about Kevin's uh, little 10-shot 10, 10 slump that he had. Um, I think that you're, all, you're well on your way here. You're, I mean, your confidence really will be built when you're shooting uh, pr in practice. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you have to have that three pillars of practice approach where you're working on the first pillar of dialing in your mechanics, the second pillar of game speed, game intensity, and just getting a ton of repetitions doing that. And then the third pillar of experience. And you know, that's where the confidence comes from, right? Yeah. And you know, one of the things I think is, excuse me, is really important too, uh, when you're shooting is not set your, your goals, uh, so high or too that, far in the future. Yeah. Um, 
because what they can do, they can really stymie or slow down your progress. If we're talking about shooting in a basketball game, if we're talking about mid-range shots, you probably are going to shoot a higher percentage, or if you're a post player, you're going to shoot a higher percentage than you will if you're out away from the baskets where maybe uh, you're shooting three balls, okay? And so a good high school uh, shooter uh, from the three line is somewhere between 38 and 42 percent. That those guys are guys who can really stroke it. So if you stop and think about this, that if I shoot 100 shots, how many of I, uh, how many can I hopefully make? You know, you make 40 and you miss 60. So don't set your high, your uh, um, your sights so high maybe on what you expect. Now, if you're a post player and you're going to be scoring around the basket, your percentage might be up in the 50s and 60s because you're so close to the basket. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Romar mm -hmm. Rivera is asking, how can I be a good coach? How can you be a good coach? I mean, that's a very broad, uh, yeah. wide open question. I think a lot of it comes down to getting experience as a player, which really helps. Yeah. Um, also, uh, being empathetic. Uh, creating a good kind of uh, work ethic, culture type thing for your team. Yeah. You know, that, that, is, a, that is an incredible uh, uh, question when you stop and think about it. There are so many things that go into being a good coach. A lot of it has to be uh, centered around your uh, ability to coach uh, the sport itself. Oftentimes, I see guys and... Um, they're basketball coaches, and this is probably more youth league kind of stuff than anything else. And they bring the guys in, they shoot a couple of layups, okay, let's scrimmage, and they run up and down, and they really don't coach them up on how to do much of anything. Uh, and there's there's a lot of criticism going on in the in basketball these days about um, AAU basketball and how they don't really spend enough time trying to develop players, but more they just want to expose them so coaches can see them. Um, but uh, to be a good coach, I think you got to have a, a really good sound basis uh, in that sport. If it's basketball, you hopefully you would have played it. Not that that cuts you out. I was watching a game the other day, and one of the coaches, whom his name I don't recall now, uh, they were talking about the fact that he had never really played the game in high school or college, but here he is coaching a, a college team because he was able to develop his skills uh, and understanding the game uh, by being an assistant coach for a long time. Okay, but I, I think your understanding of the game is important. How you deal with players is really an important part of, of the, the whole thing. You have to understand players, and, some, and a lot of them are different um, in how you have to coach them up. Some are very sensitive. Some are very uh, uh, bold. Some of them are kind of crude. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of names. And, some are uh, leaders, some are more followers. Yeah, and so and you have to learn how to manage uh, all of those different parts uh, of, of your team. And, you know, uh, sometimes it can be very trying. Uh, on occasion, uh, we'll have a player on the team who doesn't want to be coached. Um, and if you call him on something, he has a better answer, he thinks, he has a better answer to uh, the question than he thinks you're going to give him. And so I'll let that go on for uh, a couple of times, um, not very long really, uh, and then I will stop him and uh, how long have you been playing basketball? Well, I've been, he's a junior, maybe I started as a, a, a seventh grader, okay. And so uh, how long do you think the coaches on this team have been coaching basketball? And you can see that steps them back because then they have to kind of figure, okay, well, got that guy over there is an old guy, and that guy over there played at the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, or, or someplace. And so you have to learn how to manage all these different kinds of, of things. And you know there's some great books around. One of the guys that I, I, I just really uh, uh, like a lot, and I, he had um, – he had a, uh, um, an article on it the, uh, just the other day, and I can't think of what it was called, but he's a coach at um, uh, Loyola Marymount in, in Los Angeles. Just an outstanding basketball mind. He's coached uh, uh, in the NBA. He's coached a lot in college, been very successful most every place he goes. And he, his, his whole uh, um, article was about how to treat your players, how to coach them. And uh, um, I, I wish I could re uh, recall what that was, but probably if you Google uh, Mike Dunlap, 
you'll find that that article probably would be there because it's yeah. been very recently. He's a great guy too, just the nicest guy ever, but yeah. a great coach. I'm going to let it slide that you use UC Santa Cruz as like an exemplary uh, school. <laughs> okay, I meant to, I was talking like Berkeley about, or yeah, I was talking about Cal. Berkeley, but that UC Santa Cruz came into my mind. Uh, and actually they play really good basketball there as well. Their coach there does a, an outstanding job with not the best talent in the world. I know, uh, you, you, you pulled that one. I thought you were going for, for Berkeley. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Okay. Um, one thing I will say, and I, I think that you hit all the nails on the head there, is that you want to uh, ha- have them follow you and respect you out of leadership, not out of dictatorship. Um, because, you know, when people are kind of ruled by fear or intimidation, that's not really the best way to get people to follow you and do right. uh, kind of what you want them to do. If you want people to follow you, make sure they respect you and they feel like they can talk to you and maybe that you'll listen to them but not necessarily do whatever they say or or ask, but that you at least respect their opinion or hear them out. Well, let me throw one more thing in there because I think this is critical for coaching. Um, Don't have patience for people who are negative uh, uh, and affects Everybody on that team. Yeah, cancer players need to just yeah, get out. Yeah, uh, those players, the ones who are talking to players on the sideline or away from practice about how poor a coach you are or how great they are versus this other guy who is playing more than they are, you need to take and, and cut those guys off right there. Now, sometimes that means they got to go, okay? Uh, I can remember a situation a few years ago where this thing had been going on and on and on for months and months, and finally it got to a point where one of the other players said, uh, are you going to let him do, get away with that? And the coach went right to him, took him outside, took, him, took his uniform off of him, and, and sent him on his way. Everything really settled down after that uh, because you didn't have this negative uh, attitude that was always there pissing and moaning about what should be done, might be done, ought to be done and so that's I think that's maintaining a a close relationship between players and coaches is so important to your success as a coach and as a person too yeah and some people might not like this but you see that all the way up into the very top of the league like in the NBA you know DeMarcus Cousins, Rajon Rondo uh, players like that they uh, they make it tough no matter how talented and and skilled they are yeah, people don't want to play with them, or you know, they undermine and they, coaches and they, and, and they drag down coaches, they drag down teams, and they drag down schools. Yeah. Okay. So rant on that one, huh? Before we go out, I want to remind you guys: our question of the day is, "Where are you guys from? Are you from some place in the world other than where we are from? Because yeah. we want to know. Or are you from here too? We we get a few people that are from our hometown as yeah. well. Yeah. So where are you from? Our second question is this: Would are you a man-to-man type of player or are you a zone type of player? Yeah. So let us know by you saying either man-to-man or zone in the comments. But then um, tell us why, too. That's important. Yeah, if, if you're feeling up for that. Yeah. Um, and also, make sure you're following us on all our social media stuff, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. We are Shot Science on all those things. We're doing different things there all the time. Make sure that you go to ShotScience.com and you can get all of our training gear, whether that's the jump box or any of the individual training items that are there to help increase your vertical or your athleticism. Uh, Make sure you get a t-shirt because anybody that gets a t-shirt and then uh, goes on social media and does the hashtag team shot science, we see those and we like to feature people that do that kind of stuff. So get a shirt. Make sure you go to the all access area of the website at shotscience.com. You can sign up and you can check out our super in-depth training stuff there that goes beyond what we do on YouTube and gives you all the breakdowns, all the drills, all the demonstrations. Um, and we'd love to see you guys there. And if you use the promo code, all capitals, one free month exclamation point, you get a free month of that. Um, so you have no reason not to do it. So go check it out. Okay? Uh, all right. We really appreciate you guys for being here. And we will hopefully see you next time right. on our Sunday live show. Bye, guys. See you guys. Bye. Thank you.